Luke 12, 13 through 21. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge and arbitra arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared... Whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> so, last week was a lot of fun. It's always good to be on the beach. And uh, I always appreciate, I know that Brandon did a great job preaching and I appreciate the fact that we have so many in our church who are really, really good at sharing God's Word. Um, and so I was really excited, you know, week, week vacation, it's going to be fun. And so, um, but I also was thinking, well, you know, I need to peek at the scripture that I'm preaching on today. So um, I needed to figure out to do that early in the week, and let it kind of percolate, meditate, and cogitate on, uh, on the scripture for today. So uh, I grabbed my, brand, you know, my smartphone and uh, I grabbed my three folding chairs and put them in my right hand. And then I got um, two flotation devices which were under my left arm. And I barely had enough, just two fingers, to get um, the cooler full of cool, cool beverages. And here I go, walking down to the beach. And so I set my flotation devices down, put my chairs out, get the umbrella up, and just worn out with all the stuff I had. And, and then I had to read the scripture for today. I was like, oh my gosh. I, pr I said, God, I mean, couldn't it have been, couldn't you have saved this lectionary piece for a time after I did a lot of work and sacrificed a whole lot, you know? I just felt real dirty after I read this, you know, <laughs> all this stuff. Um... But then when I read it a little more closely uh, each week, what I realized is, is it's not really about money. At least not in this parable. Jesus doesn't warn against money, wealth, or material abundance. He warns against greed. And greed is an attitude. It's living a never enough life. Money is kind of neutral. We can use it for good things or bad things. We can use it to abuse. Uh, we could use it to help others. Money is not the issue. The farmer's problem isn't that he had a great harvest. He didn't steal that harvest from anybody. He didn't get it by dishonest means. It's not that he was rich or that he, he wanted to plan for the future. The, farm, the farmer's problem is that he was curved in his own vision so that everything he sees starts and ends with himself. Look at the conversation. Look at the conversation he has. He says to himself, after all this grain or all this produce, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build big, larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul... You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, drink, eat, be merry. Do you see what I mean? He's having a conversation with himself and himself alone. He's not talking uh, to a... And that's why God calls him a fool. He has fallen prey to the notion that life, and particularly the good life, consists of what he has, his possessions. Precisely the things uh, that Jesus warns against. 
He's not talking to his spouse or his children or his workers or even to God. He even quotes himself while he's talking to himself. I, and I will say to myself, soul, what, what are you to do? What are you to do? So what does the good life consist of if it doesn't consist of two flotation de devices, you know, a cooler full of ice cold beverages and three folding chairs and a beach? What does it consist of? Read what we've been reading all summer is what Jesus says it consists of. And it's one word. Relationships. What makes life good is our relationships with each other. And it's our relationship with God. That's what makes our life good. And the two can't really be separated. Hence, Jesus tells the parable, one I preached a couple weeks ago, about the Good Samaritan that invite us to think more about um, how broadly we might imagine being a good neighbor. And he preaches sermons to extol how we not only do things for the poor, but we live with the poor, or loving our enemies. Or doing good for those in need. Things that were happening this week in spades. Not once does Jesus ever lift up setting up a retirement account. Or securing a higher paying job as part of seeking the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean though that these things are bad. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm saving for later in life. And I think it's a really good idea too. <laughs> it can, money can be a good thing. You can use it to provide for your family. It can be given to others in need. It can be used to create jobs or promote for the welfare of others. We can give it to our church. Money can help you free up your own time so that you can do things for others. Money just can't produce the kind of full and abundant life that Jesus seeks, that we seek and we crave and that Jesus is offering. So it's not about the money. It's about our attitude toward money, uh, toward, uh, toward the money. It's about our attitude. It says in Timothy, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So, am I living a never enough life? Or am I living a life that sees not my things as a problem, but opportunities for me to serve God and serve others better? Whatever my answer is, it is a challenge, and I'll tell you why. You and I, we are bombarded by advertisers on TV and our computers. And the whole thing about marketing is about trying to create, make you feel insecure about something. Insecure enough to buy something. Skin care, body image, hair, whatever. The first step in a commercial is to get you to think that you need something in order to be more uh, secure. The second step, obviously, is to offer a remedy. So we're always being seduced by the same messages uh, that capture the soul of the farmer in Jesus' parable. TV is going to always exaggerate how insecure we are. It plays on our... Um, uh, we are susceptible to always feeling insecure. And, that's, and, and, and people that need to make money know that on you. Um, little wonder it is that we have such a problem. But I'll tell you this as well. It's not, we can't just blame commercials uh, on this struggle that we have. Um, having things has one distinct advantage over the abundance of life that Jesus extols. Things are immediately tangible. Boy, they make you feel so good. There is nothing like a new car smell. You know, it doesn't last very long. But you ever gotten in a car and smelled that smell? It just smells so good. Um, and the things that are most important in our lives, like relationship and community and a purpose, these kinds of things um, that Jesus invites us to strive for aren't just immediate instant gratification things. Um, you can't just go to Walmart and buy a good relationship, right? That's something you have to work on. We have to work on it in our marriages, in our family, in our church, in our working environment, with our friends. But oh man, is the work worth it as we continue to cultivate what God is called, the people that God are calling us, uh, God is calling us to, to work on those kind of 
things are the things that really enrich us. We know that wonderful feeling of what it means to be truly accepted for who we are in God's eyes and with one another, warts and all. And you can't buy that kind of thing anywhere. They say that you can't take it with you, right? I've heard the preacher say, you know, I've never seen a hearse connected to, I mean, a, 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 a U-Haul connected to a hearse. And that is true. But I do think there are things that you can take with you. Love, forgiveness, peace building, honoring God, generosity. Those things last forever. And those things nobody can take away from us. You know, according to St. Augustine, he says, uh, an, old, an old, old dude from 1600 years ago, he said, God has gifted us with people to love and things to use. Our problem, sin creeps in when we get to do it in reverse. We begin to use people and love things. So we're always constantly needing the community together to refocus what's really most important in our lives. Those things that really aren't things. Those things, though, that God has given us that will change the very substance of who we are. And a new car, as much as I like new cars, or a vacation for a week, or um, something new, will never, ever be truly able to be a substitute for the things that we're craving for the most. This week, on the beach, as I had all my stuff, it was an extended family vacation. Does anybody ever have those, like your cousins and your aunts and uncles? Anybody have those kind of vacations? Woo! They're challenging, aren't they, Charles? <laughs> yeah, you know, especially for the... Okay, yeah, that's good. That's very, that's very good. And the thing about these extended things, your cousins, and it's always hardest on the in-laws, for sure. Like, you know, you know I've, I can put up with it, and my family's loud and boisterous. Everybody's talking, nobody's listening, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and every night we have a big dinner, you know, together, and it's like, who Jen's like, whew. See, I can't say this in the late service, because, so you're getting privy information, because Jen will be there at the late service. But it's like, whew, I think I'm going to just sneak on out. You know, I was like, you, you go, girl. <laughs> you do what you need to do. Um, but there's one guy on our extended family vacation, Collins. He's my first cousin. He's, he's one of my closest friends. You know, you, you got some of those cousins. I know probably not all of your cousins are this way, but you have some cousins that you think, if they weren't my cousin, they'd be my best friend. That's who Collins is. He's about 15, 17 years younger than me, and I felt like I kind of helped bring him up in Brookhaven. Collins, after he graduated from Mississippi State, went to officer's training school for the Navy in, uh, I believe it was Rhode Island and Providence is where they trained. And Collins has been stationed in Pensacola. And so he's right there beside Perdido, you know, right where we were. And, and, and I noticed that Collins was present in a much different way than everybody else was present. Everybody else was boisterous, loud, getting into arguments. You sure can't talk about politics in my family. You're probably the same way. You know, everybody's got a little different view of it. But there's Collins just soaking it all in. Because you see, Collins is moving to Washington State. And what are you going to be doing, Collins? What are you going to be doing the next two years? He said, well, boy, I had it good. I was teaching flight school here. It was easy. What are you doing now? I'll be navigating. I said, what, what's going to be happening? He's got two beautiful little kids, Lily and uh, May. He said, I'm going to be navigating and I'm going to be going on missions. So where are you going? He said, follow the news. And I thought, oh, oh man. <laughs> I'll be praying for you, Collins. But I could tell the week for Collins because he was going to go 2,000 miles away in Washington. And he and Lauren were going to be apart while he's serving his country. That time looked different. And it wasn't about coolers and flotation devices and sunscreen. He was getting as much of the people he knows who love him as much as he could before he heads off to the West Coast. And when we got all of our junk in our car and we were driving back early, early, Saturday morning to come back from Perdido Key, my phone rang and it was Collins. He said, I had a great time. I had a great time. I said, man, I'll be praying for you. You stay safe. He said, I will. That's what we crave. 
That's what Jesus went to the cross for. That we might get it right. The things that are eternal that you can take with you, connection, friendship, love, forgiveness. That is what you will be taking with you. So here's your homework. Every day this week, find someone to connect with. You might need to reconnect with your spouse. That's all right. Or a friend. Or a stranger. Or somebody across the country. Find someone to be thankful for and reconnect. I want you to make seven connections between now and Sunday. And see if it doesn't remind you what's most important in this life. Because it ain't bigger barns. Let us pray. Lord God, we know in our heads that we, what's most important in life, you've taught us that, but sometimes in our hearts, it's hard for us to, to lean into that. But today, oh God, we lean into your everlasting arms. We lean into what is eternal, which is our connection with each other and our connection with you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. May we follow Jesus and remember what really counts in this life. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.